Well, thank you, Brian. I appreciate that introduction. And definitely in 1995, uh, when the family moved here, it was an adventure. And uh, we've continued to work with amazing people in wildlife. And a lot of our friends are here, which is nice to see uh, from Barrow and Fairbanks and other places. This is a, definitely a collaborative effort. This involves a lot of community members. It involves a lot of students. It involves a lot of colleagues. So uh, we'll, we'll try not to give all the credit to me because it would be. Uh, and the funding agencies uh, are very important too. When we talk about the funding agencies, um, NIH is one of the big ones that are supporting our, our lab, the Wildlife Toxicology Lab, uh, the Alaska Embry Program, and uh, the CANR, the Center for Alaska Native Health Research, are both NIH funded. And then, as Dr. Barnes indicated, I'm an IAB in the Biology of Wildlife at the UAF. And then we have other sources of funds from federal agencies and state agencies, too, that help our laboratory. But these are the two main programs that support our work. And some of the work I did previously uh, with the North Slope Borough was funded by the North Slope Borough and uh, many of the agencies as well. So here's the dilemma we have. And, and when we talk about fish, uh, they, they have nutrients. And so fish are very nutritious. And that's obviously why they've been exploited by us and other fish and other wildlife. But they also have contaminants. And some of these contaminants have been there for millennia. And some are more recent. Uh, the more recent ones we refer to as anthropogenic. That is, they come from humans. Or they're natural, and we've increased what we might say is their bioavailability. That is, through mining and burning of fuels, we've maybe increased the levels of those in the environment. And so some contaminants are expected and have been here for a long time, but others are from uh, our uh, activities. So fish touch us all. It's, if it's willingly or unwilling, we're, we're going to talk about that, that the fish are very important in this state. And even herbivores, and we'll talk a little bit about that, how the nutrients from marine fish can actually get into herbivores. It, it's obviously an important subsistence resource and obviously very important for recreation in this state. And so just pointing out the obvious, but the scale of it you have to really appreciate. It's valued as a food for an individual all the way up to corporations. And by that I mean commercial corporations, native corporations. So the scale of the, of the value of this can be rather large. And again, fish and wildlife depend on fish as well. And uh, Camille Liskey helped me with this, and she found all these nice little cartoons to sort of display that. So occasionally I'll get into science speak, and so we thought we would start off with some definitions. What do I mean by chemical composition? Well, it simply implies the chemicals or chemical classes we measure in these fish. Sometimes I might refer to a specific chemical or a general class of chemicals. But basically, when we talk about chemical composition, we're just saying, what are the fish made up of? Sometimes I'll say marine chemicals or marine-derived nutrients. Basically, these are the chemicals and nutrients that come from the marine environment, from biological processes in the marine system. So the ocean will be the source of these chemicals and nutrients that we'll be talking about. And there are special techniques that we can use to detect which chemicals have come from the marine environment. One of them is known as stable isotopes of carbon and nitrogen and sulfur. These are techniques you can use along with some other chemical markers that we can trace what comes from the marine environment. Chemicals, this does not imply good or bad, just that they are. So we don't want anybody to read into the term chemicals. Dr. Whipley's in our group. Um, he's in our department and he's a stream ecologist, and he's done some really interesting work where he's looked at freshwater biota, in particular in the Copper River and somewhat in the Yukon River, and he's shown that these marine nutrients from salmon can reach plants and animals. He's used these special chemical tools to look at how marine nutrients can get upstream and into the biota along these streams. So the fish from the mouth of the Yukon River to Whitehorse take up marine-derived nutrients, and by fish I mean the freshwater fish not talking about the anadromous fish, the salmon are bringing their chemicals, nutrients and contaminants, to these freshwater systems all the way to Whitehorse. And so in his studies with his students, the salmon carry chemicals to freshwater resident fish about 2,000 kilometers from the ocean. Okay, so we're talking about in this state basically almost every region of the state being impacted because salmon can move these chemicals up these streams and into lakes and in smaller streams. 
So I thought this was really interesting because some other investigators have shown PCBs and mercury move up these streams based upon salmon uh, migrations. Uh, and what Dr. Whipley and his students have shown is that not only are they moving it, but if the spawner density is high, this marker for marine signature of chemicals, this delta 15N is a marker for marine signature, also goes up. And so they've shown very nicely that the amount of spawner fish that are in these streams relates to the marine signatures. And other investigators have shown that these are also transporting nutrients and contaminants. So when you look at the Kenai Peninsula, I think of this since I have veterinary training, I think, well, this is a series of arteries and veins. Now, I know you know the water flows to the ocean. The fish go the other direction. So what's happening is the fish are moving into this Kenai Peninsula and they're transporting nutrients and other chemicals like contaminants into the Kenai Peninsula, into these lakes and into these rivers. And here are some of the sampling stations that Dr. Whiffley's team used and, and they've done this all over the state to show how important this is. These chemicals enter insects, plants, other fish, bears, wolves. There's been recent work on the Kenai and in other places in Denali National Park that are showing wolves are eating a lot of fish. And in some of our studies where we've been working with fish and game on wolves, like for instance, Kimberly Beckman's been helping us with this, we're finding higher concentrations of mercury in these wolf packs that appear to be feeding on fish. So we also consider mercury what we call a marker for fish consumption. So we're learning a lot about the ecology of these systems and we're learning things like wolves have been exploiting fish. Even though there's not an obvious source of the fish, they're, they're obviously getting into these streams and finding fish. So this is all fascinating to think about how fish reach plants and biota in Alaska. It's essentially, like I said, a, a series of arteries and veins that these fish are using. And I think of it as a giant liver or some kind of tissue that just gets all these nutrients um, brought in by the fish. So our dogma in the lab is healthy animals result in healthy foods, result in healthy people and communities. We strongly believe this. We encourage that people understand the health status of the animals they depend on. For food, this is just good practice. Uh, this is good agriculture, this is good subsistence, this is good fisheries management to know that you have healthy animals to provide healthy foods. Well, when we think about fish, we have to think about how those fish chemicals reach us. And one way is through things that eat fish. This is a harbor seal that Darcy Holcomb's working on in Huna. We were there working with the students and, and uh, the, the native corporations there to better understand their harbor seals. But basically, this is a pathway for fish, nutrients, and chemicals to this community. And so when we talk about piscivores or piscivory, we're talking about fish consumption. Some seals are highly dependent on fish. So they're essentially mostly made of fish and this is another route for fish nutrients and contaminants to things that would use these as food like stellar sea lions, like people, and up north polar bears, killer whales. So you can see in Alaska our fish web is a little more complicated than just going to the supermarket. And again, we're all trying to learn together. This engaged uh, high school students and teachers, hunters and food preparers, uh, someone like me, the graduate students. And so it was a nice uh, demonstration of outreach, community participation, and Darcy sneaking a sample every now and then. Now this is work Sarah Moses did, and one of her posters is, I, I can't use the pointer, that's not good for eyes. So it's, it's over there. She did a nice study in Kotzebue. Um, a couple of her uh, chapters in her thesis are already published, and so we can talk about this data, and she did some other interesting work there too, where we took a closer look at food processing. Some of the processing that goes on with fish is pretty intensive. So here's she fish, this was our animal model up there. This is a raw filet, and obviously then other methods of uh, preparing it are baked, dried, and smoked. And so she did a study saying, well, how do the nutrients and contaminants change? Well, it turned out they changed dramatically, but some cases it increased, in some cases it decreased, depending on the chemical you're interested in and the tissue processing method. Now, intuitively, you should think that losing water would increase concentrations. That's true for some chemicals. But those chemicals that tend to be more volatile or 
susceptible to what we would call photooxidation or something along those lines would actually decrease. So we showed that in some cases there was increases, in other cases no change, and some decreases. But the point was, as Dr. Barnes said, you have to assess the end of the fork. This is what people are eating. They're not eating that, and they rarely eat that. But most consumption advice is given based on this, and we don't think that's appropriate for our state because people significantly alter their food. So when we think of nutrients and contaminants, you can think we think of, of classes like minerals, vitamins A and C, beta carotene, cholesterol, fatty acids, and of course, as we know, some nutrients are better for us than others after just eating a ribeye down there in the restaurant. Um, couldn't help myself. Uh, contaminants, uh, we have classes like heavy metals, the brominated flame retardants, and organochlorines, which you probably know as PCBs, DDT, chemicals like that. So again, we're, we have a complicated mixture of chemicals that we're addressing here. And, and Sarah Moses uh, got her PhD addressing some of these in she fish and in spotted seals, looking at how tissue changes in chemical composition occurred with food processing. And the community was very uh, excited about that because they wanted something relevant. We learned more about how contaminants and nutrients behave as far as being processed for foods. And we learned a lot more, if you read the poster, about how these contaminants in she fish and spotted seals vary in their ability to concentrate in the animal. And that poster over there, sir, clearly shows that an air-breathing animal accumulates toxicants like the OCs or PCBs differently than gilled animals. And it all has to do with how they excrete it. If they're gilled, they excrete directly into the water. If they're breathing air, they have lungs like us. Completely different mechanisms for excretion, and it results in different concentrations of some of the contaminants. That might be a little bit, but think about it for a minute, that respiration is a way we eliminate things. And the police obviously use that to their advantage for certain kind of chemicals that we like to become intoxicated with. So you can appreciate the lungs and the gills are quite different in how things would move across and get into the air or the water. And what Sarah showed was that's showing up in Kotzebue as well. So it's not just the absorption from the food web, it's also how the animals excrete the compounds that results in the concentrations we see in their food. So again, it's a really complicated mixture, so we want to focus. To make it happen, you have to have relationships with people like, like this and, and a trusting wife. So finding motivated hunters and food preparers is really important. This is uh, Price Brower from Barrow, Alaska, obviously allowing us access to a bowhead whale. In some of these other communities, it tends to be women who are food preparers that we work with mostly. Um, there's, there's a big difference between hunting and preparing food. And in some communities, you end up working with the women because they know more about the food. Whereas if you want to know more about the animal and its environment, you might work with a hunter. But working with both is pretty strategic. <laughs> it, it works out for you. And so we've been, we've been very happy with the communities we've been in and have had excellent cooperation. And we're, we're thrilled about that. So again, back to the end of the fork. Typically, the scientists have studied raw tissue, and they've either addressed nutrients or contaminants. What we've done with Sarah's study, and, and now with some studies that a postdoc, Camille Liske, and Maggie Castellini's helping with, we're trying to do a balanced approach where we address nutrients and contaminants at the same time. And so in Kotzebue, this worked out really well. But then we have to add this layer of complexity is that what people eat at the end of the fork are, are changed. This is more relevant to the human consumer. And we, we would hope that people would start to appreciate this in the studies they do, because typically people will just simply uh, study the raw tissues. And sometimes they study raw tissues that people don't eat. And sometimes they don't study the tissues people mostly eat. And so we're trying to change the perspectives on some of these studies to include how the subsistence user or the recreational user sees the animals as food. So in this state, coastal Alaska, the food's right at the doorstep. And uh, as most people know, we have more coast than the whole lower 48. I could go on and on how big the state is and how coastally dependent we are. And 
but that really tr translates into a lot of people depending on fish, directly and indirectly. I just love this. Ugh. I get hungry when I see that. So we have salmon drying here, and we have uh, probably an ice seal drying over here, uh, anti-scavenging device. <laughs> okay. Apparently it keeps the uh, flying scavengers away. But uh, you, you see this all over the state. This is an image that I just think portrays coastal Alaska and, and the large rivers in Alaska. And we have to remember that this is Pacifery eating row. We have to remember how important it is, the, the processing, what tissues are actually taken for consumption. And I was reminded earlier today that dog teams depend on fish. That's true. And so just trying to drive home that how important uh, the fish are and the processing of the fish culturally and nutritionally. I have a couple anthropology types staring at me right now, so I had to say culturally, because it really is a part of the practice of the community that's important too. Here's a young lady I'm related to, and here's a, a typical fish drying rack. And you'll see these all over these communities. And so the amount of fish that's being harvested and dried can be huge. So a nice picture from Camilla here. Uh, I hear a lot of communities say, the ocean is my garden. Well, it's their fish market too, okay? And a lot of people in coastal Alaska uh, really feel strongly about this, that this is the major source of food for them. Not to mention the commercial interests. So we can't talk about all these nutrients and contaminants. So we, we agreed on these two we would discuss. One is a lipid. It's more specifically a fatty acid, and it's the polyunsaturated fatty acids, or we like to call PUFAs. Uh, we'll mostly talk about the omega-3 PUFAs. I've narrowed down now for you a thousand chemicals to the omega-3s, which are very few. They're, the fatty acids are very complicated and very important in health. The contaminant we'll focus on is methylmercury. Uh, that's a bias because that's what our group focuses on. It's also a bias because that's the only chemical the states put out an advisory on. And so I thought it would be worthwhile to discuss that. Not to mention the cohort of concern is the fetus and the neonate of the human, as well as other fish-eating animals. So that, that tends to get people's attention too. Well, here's mercury, good old mercury, HG. Sometimes my son says, my dad studies mercury. He would hope it was the planet, though, not the element. <laughs> Am I right, Lars? Would you prefer I studied the planet? No, not really? OK. So mercury can arrive from a whole variety of sources, mining, manufacturing, energy production, medicine, and dentistry. Oh, boy, did that cause some scuttle. Um, I guess some of you know about mercury and being associated with some uh, child behavior disorders. Some people call it autism. Um, this has become very controversial. And in April, I believe, we're going to have a dentist coming from the University of Rochester to talk to the community about dental amalgams. Uh, his name's Gene Watson. He's been invited to give a seminar at the campus, and he's willing to give a public seminar too. And so we might just talk about mercury again, and he'll come from the medical dentistry point of view. And he's willing to give a public presentation on that. So you can see mercury's getting um, into the environment and to us through many methods and routes. Mercury occurs in numerous forms and, and we chemists and toxicologists talk about it all the time, but I thought I'd spare you a, a mercury chemistry lecture. But please recognize that when someone says mercury, you might want to pin them down on exactly what form of mercury they're talking about. And so not to violate one of my own rules, we're talking about methylmercury. Okay, it's the neurotoxin and it occurs in fish. Some of you might be aware of dimethylmercury, which was an unfortunate accident for a scientist out east who died. She exposed herself in research to dimethylmercury. That's when there's two methyl groups attached to it. That's a very toxic, potent neurotoxin. And uh, we're talking about monomethylmercury here, okay? So we don't want to get these methylmercuries confused. And this is well known to occur in fish. No surprise there. Dramatic pictures from one of our undergraduates who gave a presentation in a lab of, oh, look at all the mercury spewing into the environment. You gotta love the enthusiasm of the undergraduates. That's drama, you know, big rocks and, but these are some of the sources of mercury. 
this is something else that Chris showed us and I thought was very interesting. He showed a, a, a core from a glacier, Upper Fremont Glacier, where they measured mercury concentrations over time. And it's the Wind River Mountain Range of Wyoming. It's the Upper Fremont Glacier. And, well, this is a Geophysical Institute sponsored talk, so I had to sneak in a glacier. Is that okay, Brian? I, it's not biology, but it's close, it's okay. He said it was okay. So if you look down here, you can see a nice baseline for mercury concentrations with an occasional event, a natural event, like a volcano. But then these anthropogenic events around 1850 or so start to pop in, the gold rush, another natural event. But note, we continue this baseline up here, but unfortunately around 1900, that baseline seems to be shifting upward. Mercury deposition might be increasing again because of our activities. And so this region here may be associated with industrialization. It's a little speculative, but you have to admit that these spikes associated with certain events and this shift in baseline is intriguing. And it does fit with other data. So here's our dramatic source of mercury and the mercury's in, in the environment usually deposited into a freshwater system. And when that mercury gets down into these anaerobic sediments, you would think it might just turn back into rock and go back into deeper and deeper layers. But there's bacteria down here that will convert it to its organic form, that methylmercury form again. Well, that methylmercury form, the it's now known as an organic mercury or methylmercury, is highly bioavailable to fish and fish prey. This starts the whole process. It enters the food web there, and we get biomagnification. And so let's talk a little bit about this. So when the methylmercury gets into the invertebrates, the small fish, and, and, and goes into larger fish, this is biomagnification. The higher on the food web an animal feeds, especially a fish-based food web, the mercury tends to biomagnify in those tissues. Okay. So fish-based mercury biomagnification, direct consumption of fish, obviously. So if it's in the fish, eating the fish directly or passivity is a pathway. But we have to also think about consumption of fish eaters is less direct. So we have to observe, uh, note, note or observe, but may be more important due to biomagnification. An animal or human eats a seal. The mercury got to the seal via fish. We have to include seabirds. We have to include whales all these other potential routes for fish consuming animals. So then we get to the consumers of those who eat fish eaters. You can see we're moving on up here and polar bears, stellar sea lions, large predatory fish, i.e. big sharks. Okay, so we have the eaters of fish eaters of fish eaters of fish eaters. You can see where I'm going here, but that's really hard to do in text. So our simple food chains that show fish to fish transfer of mercury to humans they're not appropriate models for Alaska from our perspective. And let me give you a diagram. So here's what we would call the too simple model. Little fish, medium fish, big fish, human. That's just, that's too like the evolution of man kind of thing. It's, it's far too linear. Here, this is how biologists and ecologists think. Everything's connected. So I take this simple model and I apply it to a subsistence user Suddenly this fish is magnified multiple times and through many pathways. This fish is via a seal is magnified. These fish are magnified through the whale, like a beluga whale. The seal directly, again, the seal to the polar bear. So in our system in Alaska, we need to think about things that eat fish as fish. When we talk about the nutrients and contaminants and the pathways to people and to the various wildlife that depend on fish. So the polar bear and the killer whale depend on fish, even if the killer whale's eating stellar sea lions or harbor seals. It's a fish-dependent food web. And that's the pathway for the contaminants and nutrients. So we're doing this work, uh, Camille and Maggie are leading it, where we're trying to look at raw and processed food across the state. We talked about the study we did in Kotzebue, and there was interest in taking it to other regions. So based on concentrations, one's device is impacted by numerous factors. 
So how would you communicate these findings to a community? I'm not presenting community-based data here. I'm just presenting overall Alaska data. When we go to a specific community, we present the data we generated in that community, and it's been reviewed by the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium and the state's epidemiologist's office. And we provide all our data to them so that they can improve or change any consumption advice they might want to do. So I don't give consumption advice. We just help the appropriate organizations to do it, and we relay their message. So the university, I don't think, wants to get in the business of public health as far as advisory, but we do want to help generate data and help communities get better information. So here's some examples of fish from Alaska. A variety of fish you can see here. Camilla's rank them according to their mercury concentrations. This is part per million. And initially, you know, well, why are we here? Why are we talking about this? The FDA action level for commercial fish is one part per million. All these fall well below that. Well, we're done. Good night. Well, as you probably well know, agencies can't agree. So the Canadians said, well, you know, we've got to be better than the Americans. They lowered it by half. So they're at about a half a part per million. Well, we couldn't allow that to happen. No, no, no. Oops. Not sure what happened there. There we go. So let's take another perspective. This, I'm sorry, let's go back just to make the point. This is based on concentration in the fish. Okay, I want to emphasize that. So what happens if we consider how much fish is consumed by a person who weighs 70 kilograms and it's 100 gram servings per day? How does that affect our calculations? How does that, based on amount fish consumed, so if you're, not a community, if you're a community member trying to understand this, you've probably already gotten lost. But I'll do my best to try and help you here. So scientifically speaking, this stands for no observed adverse effect level. That means there's been no observed effect below this concentration, part per million, in the fish of a person 70 kilograms eating 100 gram serving. Oops, this is Alaska's consumption advice. Well, now we've gotten into some of the sculpin and halibut down here that have been processed for food. But nothing really to get too alarmed about because most of the fish are well below that. And this is the average, and this rep represents a standard deviation. Oh, no. CDC has an organization, uh, Agency for Toxic Substances and blah, blah, blah. And so CDC uh, has a level that brings us down a little bit. So now we include more fish. Uh-oh. Health Canada and FDA have a lower level here. World Health Organization and another standard in Health Canada, that would be for pregnant women, for example. Now we can see this message is getting very confusing. And it's not over yet. US EPA. You, you select how you're going to communicate with the community. This is very frustrating for us. We've got one agency all the way out here, and we have another agency right there. So luckily, Camilla's a postdoc, and it's all her responsibility. I don't know if she's here. Good luck. No, I'm kidding. We're going to help her. But this, you can see why the message is complicated. You can choose the regulations to fit your desired outcome. But we don't want to do that. So what about body weight? I... You know, 70 kilograms is 150 pounds. That slightly underestimates my personal body weight. Just a little bit. So watch this. I mean, so you add these different body weights. Camilla did this calculation. Now, now all of a sudden body weight can affect how you might want to interpret these results. 88 pound up to a 200 pound individual. This has gotten very complicated, but this is toxicology. It's, it's all based on the dose. It's all based on the body weight. It, it, it's not a simple message that they're trying to convey. So further, we want to note that halibut, when it's raw, is about here. But then with food processing, we tend to see an increase in the concentrations of mercury. So into the fork could be really important assessment here, not just simply taking what's raw from the fish. 
So this is our communication dilemma. Communicating results is not straightforward. We have to we have taken the route of presenting the data and that in, we want to give it in the context of the state of Alaska recommendations. We would prefer not to use other recommendations because at least the state of Alaska is considering subsistence use, other nutrients. And we think communities should really make their own decisions. We should give them the information and let them decide what their hunting and food processing practices will be. There is definitely a need for better understanding of all these recommendations. And we'll go over a little bit of that. So are we alone in this dilemma? Uh, clearly not. What about other regions in their fish? What about commercial resources? What is the state of Alaska considered and implemented? We've given you some handouts in the back to show you their fish consumption calculator. And what about PCBs? Uh, McBride put together some data from Washington that uh, is some of it's relevant to Alaska and some of it's not. But here they sampled a commercial market and they only did raw samples, but I wanted to show you their approach. And unfortunately this figure didn't come out too well, but um, this is the mercury concentrations in part per billion, and this is about a half a part per billion, half a part per million right here. And uh, this was catfish, and then down here was halibut. Um, we apologize for the slide. They, this is a Mac, and I did mine on a PC. You know the story. And then this was for PCBs, and this is salmon, and they were the highest of their concentrations. But I put in here, you can't read it unfortunately, farmed fish, question mark. Yes, a salmon is not a salmon is not a salmon when you get to Washington and other parts. Farmed raised salmon have been shown to have much higher concentrations of PCBs and mercury than wild caught salmon in Alaska. It's because they feed the salmon food that is derived from fish meal. This was actually an article in Science. It was that big a deal. Again, the slide didn't come out because it's a PC, but um, these are the calculations he used don't worry about it, of course, but they use the reference doses from EPA. And again, all the things we talked about, body weight, meal size, and they calculated this curve. So here's the meals per month for a 70 kilogram person that would be permitted based on the concentration of mercury in the fish. Interesting curve. They then did the same thing for meal recommendation calculations using similar parameters here. Don't worry, I'm getting to the main point. They then plotted their fish on this curve. So this is the number of meals per month. Well, when you get down to like tuna and red snapper, you can see you're at about two to four meals per month. But again, look way out here, that confusing advice. FDA's action level for commercial foods is way out there. So if you look at this curve, this tells you the meals based on the concentration of fish for a 70 kilogram human. I'm not so sure this helps, but it was their approach to try and communicate the data. So this may not seem like a big deal, but for a subsistence user, this would be. Those, those meal rates would be rather low. Subsistence communities are documented to have much higher fish consumption rates than that. Um, for those who have limited fish use, recreational, maybe commercial, it may not be a big deal. So again, we stress the advice needs to be put in the context of the consumers. So here it is for PCBs. And here are those salmon, and I, I bet you those were farm raised. And so the halibut, red snapper, and tuna were lower than the salmon. Note where the FDA tolerance level is, 2,000 parts per billion. That would be over here somewhere. It's even more disparate uh, when we talk about the agency's approach to PCBs. It's very complicated. So when McBride decided to put the data together, this, the only fish that could have unlimited consumption was Pollock. Not, a good, not good news for the sea lions, by the way. <laughs> um, if you know that story, the, the Pollock fishery and the sea lions. But notice that it's not very consistent that um, White tuna, for example, when it comes to mercury, very limited. When it comes to PCBs, unlimited. So the PCBs and mercury do not correlate. They will give you varying consumption advice. So if we keep adding contaminants onto this, 
It's, st it's statistically and mathematically possible that you couldn't eat any fish. Think about it. I mean, we have to be reasonable about this. So how do you approach this kind of dilemma? You'll study enough contaminants until you find that all the fish are not edible. And of course, that's not realistic. So here are the websites, um, and we have the handouts of this in the back. They've also recently put out a, a YK Delta Pike mercury poster. Um, Northern Pike have very high concentrations of mercury compared to the data I just showed you here. And that's because they're older fish, and they can be from lakes that are high in mercury naturally. And so now the pike are getting a focus for uh, mercury concentrations. So in the back, we have the 12-point system. Be careful on what, which handout you get from the state. They sometimes had a 24-point system, but we're providing you with the 12-fish point system. Here are the categories of fish, and there are certain points with these categories of fish that you then add up to get how much of those fish you can consume. And in some cases, there's unlimited fish consumption in the green box, those fish. And so we've provided this as a handout. And this has been their approach, and it's really about all they can do at this point, is say, go ahead and eat unlimited amounts of this fish, be careful with these fish. And uh, this is advice targeting women of childbearing age and children under 12. Everybody else should just ignore this, okay? As, as a middle-aged male, I realize I'm irrelevant to the gene pool now, and, and no one cares, even, even my epidemiologist. So I can eat all the fish I want. So God bless all the middle-aged men out there. You can eat all you want. So we have to strike a balance here between the contaminants and nutrients. Remember, these fish have protein, oils, vitamins, and minerals. It's very important to present this balance. We want to present pros and cons, not just pros or cons. You'll find many people specialize in either giving you the good news or the bad news. We're really trying to be both. We're, we're kind of schizophrenic. Oh, yeah, there's mercury in there, but look at all the fatty acids and selenium, and oh, yeah, there's PCBs. But oh, yeah, so we do know that's schizophrenic, but it's the balanced message that we're trying to achieve. Again, this is part of a PhD project Sarah Moses did, and she's now in Wisconsin working with the Ojibwa on this very issue, fish consumption. Um, we're pretty proud of that. Fatty acid composition, the ecology, physiology, and human nutrition. I'll go through that real quick. Oh, that's like her favorite fatty acid. So this is a heterogeneous group of compounds. I'd like to point out again that they are essential. If we don't have some of these fatty acids in our diet, vital functions stop. They're, they're essential for physiology. However, what we're learning is some of these non-essential fatty acids are very health-promoting or disease-preventing. This is very important right now in, in biomedical sciences is that these non-essential fatty acids actually could be very health-promoting. Some are actually considered harmful. I think many of you know about the saturated fats, trans, the trans fad. Um, so some are actually potentially harmful. They're very diverse, and the majority of lipids are in all organisms. But the important components in a fish-based food web involve these omega-3 fatty acids. Here's an example of an omega-3 fatty acid. I know it's not beautiful to some of you, but it uh, makes my heart go pitter-pat, is this hydrocarbon chain with these strategically placed double bonds. Most of us involved in physiology know that this is very important and that this structure right here is very important in, in biology. And these fatty acids are represented like this as well. But these are really important for proper uh, physio physiological functions. So over here are the PUFAs, but I want to remind you there's many different classes of these fatty acids. You know, boo, saturated fatty acids, right? Boo, we've learned that. PUFAs, that's something very important in the fish diet. The way we store these lipids is really important. Here's glycerol in a fatty acid. This glycerol backbone is what stores the fatty acids for us. It takes three of the fatty acids to form a triglyceride. This is what's stored in lipid and blubber, okay? And this is, it could potentially be all fish derived. And so the next slide shows how some of these are important for making cell membranes. This is a phospholipid here. 
very important in constructing cell membranes. So some very basic functions these fatty acids are critical for. We like to talk about membrane fluidity. The fatty acids help maintain membrane fluidity so the cells function properly. You got to have the right fatty acids. So we mentioned already the food web. Well, the blubber is an important tissue to think about. And Sarah did one of her studies in Kotzebue and where she showed the fatty acid composition by blubber depth was very different. So actually, the marine mammal is strategically laying down its blubber with these fatty acids in mind. And so we don't want to just think of it as a storage depot. Things like blubber have importance for energy storage, thermoregulation, streamlining, buoyancy, locomotion. And so these fatty acids in these marine mammals are playing a very strategic role in blubber. It's not just simply a storage location, OK? And she had this as a part of her thesis and will be a manuscript. And, and so we want you to appreciate that in the wildlife, these fatty acids are very important for their function, like a tissue like blubber. Well, for us and for other mammals, these omega-3 fatty acids, they're being shown to have a very important role. One that's very dramatic is cardioprotection. And we always have to say it's not proven yet, but I'm pretty convinced because that's what they're marketing fish oil on, is this whole cardioprotective component that it, it either prevents or lessens the damage due to coronary disease or a heart attack. Anti-diabetogenic. Um, one of the students in the lab, Darcy, said that's her favorite word now. What that is is that we had to find a fancy way to say prevents diabetes. Anti-diabetogenic, that some of these PUFAs may actually be helping people who should be at high risk for diabetes. And uh, the Center for Alaska Native Health Research has been looking into obesity and, and various diseases. And remarkably, some populations that should have high risk factors and should be expressing diabetes, they aren't expressing diabetes. So there's some evidence in populations that the, the high fish diet in these PUFAs are preventing diabetes. Neurodevelopment, the irony of all this, the mercury is of concern because of the fetus and the, and, the, and the recently born. Well, fish and the PUFAs are important for neurodevelopment of the fetus and the neonate. Very specific dilemma we face in giving advice about eating fish. It's well known that it enhances neurodevelopment. We work with colleagues at the University of Rochester who have been doing studies in the Seychelles. And so I'm going to share an anecdote with you about their research. They were concerned about mercury exposure in the women and the children in the Seychelles Islands who eat a lot of marine fish. They went in, did the study, and of course they anticipated that as mercury concentrations increased in the women, that the neurodevelopment would be decreased in the children and their intelligent tests and scores would be lower. They, they blindly did this and then they came back and crunched all the data, the exact opposite. Increasing mercury levels meant a better performance on behavioral and intelligence tests. Well, they all had to go back to the Rochester and scratch their heads, right? What happened? Well, what happened was mercury turned out to be a biomarker for fish consumption. It was the fatty acids that drove the improved performance and the, and the improved neurodevelopment. Now, recognize these tests are done at certain stages of childhood development. So we're really talking about delays in development. But what was interesting is the mercury showed high fish consumers had children who performed better. So you also have to think about mercury as a marker of fish consumption, not just a toxicant. They learned that, and they've gone back and done studies and showed, sure enough, the PUFAs are ameliorating or blocking the effects of mercury. Isn't that fascinating? I think it is. Of course, that's what I study. So we have to think about other things. We have to think about how omega-3s relate to the omega-6s. That's a big thing in, in fatty acid research now is the ratio of fatty acids. OK, now you have to take the right amount, but now you have to have the right ratio. It's physiology. It's always going to be like this. And then the other antioxidants in the fish are important. Selenium, vitamin E. All of this is, is really important to consider. And we also have to consider how rendering and oxidation during food processing may be decreasing nutrient um, composition. That's some of the stuff we're working on.
So the bottom line is healthy and abundant fish equal healthy northern residents. I don't give consumption advice as a community, but as a family, I can say we enjoy fish. Somehow Channel 11 got my son and interviewed him. I heard him say fish are awesome. I guess they got that on film. Um, but these guys depend on fish. They're, they're dependent on animals that depend on fish. And so we need to think of these guys as sentinels for the Arctic. Some of the students in our lab have identified these as sentinels for the Arctic. For infectious diseases, Cassie Kirk, for contaminants like PCVs and mercury, Katrina Knut, have all recognized these as very important sentinels for the Arctic. And their whole food web is based on fish, if you really get down to it. And, and so they're sentinels that eat similar diets as people. And uh, we got to keep that in mind. So to wrap up, why is it difficult to give consumption advice? You have to consider the multiple nutrients and multiple contaminants concurrently. I, I really believe that we need to improve that as scientists. We need to be addressing them at the same time and in the same context. Intake should be based on consumption rate, body size, and pregnancy status. We need to be giving specific advice. The states tried to do that by saying this consumption advice for fish is for women of childbearing age and children under the age of 12. They've tried to really get that message across. Meal intake of fish is not single species and size fish. The state kind of has to force that in their advice. And, and that's kind of unfortunate because we think fish diets are very diverse. People just don't eat halibut and people just don't eat salmon usually. It's a mixture of the species and of the processing methods. So it's a mixture. Food preparation methods have to be considered. We've shown that. We have conflicting commercial political advocacy perspectives um, as advising bodies. You showed, we showed that in the graphic where I started putting up all the different criteria. There's obviously different perspectives on uh, how we should be regulating this. We also think user context is important. When people from Florida and Washington DC come to Alaska to tell us how to do fish advisories, frankly, it's insulting. Um, they, they approach it from a completely different perspective and Alaskans really resent it. We want to do our own fish advisory work. Um, and so because we have these three interests that are really important. Marine fish reach many levels, geography and feeding habits. I hope I got across to you that fish penetrate the interior. They're important on the coast. They affect the chemistry of, of a lot of biota, including plants. I think that's really neat. The pathways for nutrients and contaminants can be direct and indirect, but we need to consider them because they biomagnify in that indirect route, like the polar bear. All its most of its contaminants are fish-based and they're biomagnified to much higher concentrations and they can reach broadly. Proper, steward of proper stewardship of fish and those dependent on them must include their chemical composition and the associated critical pathways. In other words, I love fishing game, but it's not just about abundance. You don't want to just think about abundance when it comes to the importance of foods for people. It's also about chemical composition. And a lot of them are sensitive to that in fishing game, saying, well, we need to make sure the fish are not just abundant, but they're healthy. Okay, and I'm trying to get that across to you as an audience saying, we can have a lot of a fish resource, but what happens if it's not usable? Or it's, or it's poor in nutrition or high in contaminants? The abundance wouldn't matter, would it? And so we want to make sure we appreciate that as Alaskans, that the chemical composition of our resources is important. Proper health consideration should consider both the benefits and risks, just not one aspect. Again, we're emphasizing that, that when you think about fish, think about the pros and the cons, not the pros or the cons. And when you're getting advice from some agency or from some person, take a look at their perspective, because if their only mandate is to address the contaminant, they're not even going to bring up the nutrients. And, and in your mind, you should be thinking about the nutrient value of those fish as well. Back to the galaxy, I guess. Thank you. I think Stevie's going to handle questions, right? Yes. So I'll sit um, down then. I will be handing a microphone and Brooke will be handling a microphone. So if you could just raise your hand or make yourself known if you have a question, take one in the front. 
Uh, thank you for your talk, sir. <clears throat> I work for the United States Geological Survey. When I first started, I was looking at mercury concentrations in pike and kind of relating it spatially. Mm -hmm. And one thing I ran into was atmospheric deposition of mercury right. and its methylation off of the snow surface mm -hmm. uh, in northern Alaska and in interior Alaska. Is there like any kind of a study looking at the inorganics of mercury landing on the snow and methylating there and then getting into the environment? You work for Angela Matz, right? I remember meeting you, I think. The, no, you don't work with Angela? No, okay. Um, that's an excellent question because there's something going on in the Arctic called polar sunrise, where when mercury is in the area of the marine environment, it's at, interacting with some halogens that are in the sea ice or coming up from the ocean. And when the sun comes back up after being at the horizon or below the horizon, it's energizing the system to create reactive mercury is what we might call it. And then it's deposited on the snow. And I know that some people from, uh, oh, where is it? Some people are up in Barrow looking at what happens uh, when the reactive mercury interacts with the snow to see if it just simply runs off, volatilizes again, or as you are saying, enters the food web. And I don't know if Bill Simpson's here. Bill? Bill's a chemist at the UAF who's working on some of these dynamics. And there's other people at UAF too. And so that's a question of what happens when these polar sunrise events or related events occur where mercury is volatilized up and then reacts with these halogens and forms this reactive mercury that comes back down. That could be a really important mechanism for entering the food web. But I don't know of anybody that's proven the methylation process in the snow or below the snow. Does anybody know that? I Yep. Right. Oh, that's who you're working with. Okay. Yeah, so it's the methylation process, you're right, that's critical to eating food web, and I still think they're trying to sort that out. But they were completely surprised by this spike when the sun came up in Barrow that the mercury was behaving that way. And now it's been worked out chemically. There's, I think there's a question everywhere. The chart that you showed that had the various levels of consumption from different agencies, have those levels changed over the last decades? Uh, yeah, they always change. That's sort of the problem. Um, that would be an interesting thing for Camilla and our lab to do is to show you how agencies have changed their criteria. What we showed you was their most current advice. Uh, many of those groups have actually changed their criteria over time. And that adds to the confusion. Yep. If we did a historical thing, that thing would be all blacked out. But that's a very good point. The agencies do change their criteria as more epidemiological evidence comes in and uh, as more benchtop science comes in. Just before I came here, I read an unfortunate article where someone had fed mice uh, fish laced with mercury and shown that the mice were affected. And uh, I was like, wow, that's really interesting. Then I looked at the always go to the materials and methods. They fed them way too much fish. They, they probably created a malabsorption, so they probably had a malnutrition. <laughs> uh, it was a pretty shocking amount of fish they were feeding mice. I have another question over here. Oh. I would assume that a large halibut would have more um, <clears throat> mercury than a small one. So what's a good size to fish for? <laughs> Chicken halibut. Uh, you're dead on. Um, the, the, what drove the state to really do that point system was halibut. Because there's halibut that are unlimited consumption. The small halibut, I believe up to like 29 pounds. And then the larger halibut, I believe 80 or 100 pounds or more, get up into those high point categories, which means limited consumption. So this comes back to how do you eat your halibut? If you're a recreational sports fisherman, you bring that whole halibut home, oops. But if you're a community and you catch one large halibut and 50 small halibuts and you share, that big halibut gets spread out. That's why we're saying context is so important for someone who catches a huge halibut and just takes it home and eats off of it for two years. 
that's where we're getting at with this point system, that would probably be the high end of mercury exposure we would see in the state. So halibut's a great example of the size of the fish driving the consumption advice. And it's, they've spelled it out real nice with pounds, not kilograms, in, in that scoring system. We have a question back here. Okay. Two questions. Uh, did you do any studies on grayling? And then the second one is, uh, we don't have much manufacturing up here. We have some coal mining, but uh, has anyone ever kind of quantified the amount of mercury coming across in the Arctic haze from Russia and all their coal mines and China and all their uh, coal power plants, I mean? The grayling question is a good one. I would have to, the DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation, does a fish study. I'd have to contact Bob Gerlach, the state veterinarian, and see how many grayling they've had submitted to them. They typically focus on marine fish of commercial interest and subsistence interest, but there may be some grayling in that database. Since they eat insects mostly, I'll put them at a low risk, but that's just guessing based on their feeding habits. They mostly eat small fish and, and insects, so I wouldn't put them at a, and they don't tend to be long-lived, but something to look at, because some people depend a lot on grayling. Industry. Uh, well, we blame everything on China now, right? So what the heck? Yeah, China, coal-burning countries are the mercury deposition sources for us. It used to be Europe, it used to be the eastern U.S., now it's China. Unfortunately, China sends it straight to Alaska. And so that's why there's a lot more uh, effort going into monitoring mercury inputs and mercury concentrations in various parts of Alaska. And actually the National Park Service has done something interesting. They're, they're doing contaminants monitoring around the whole U.S. And some of that's occurring within the park systems where you would expect pristine areas and they're getting a really good handle on inputs. Like for instance even the uh, 2.5 that we have here, of course the inversion in town holds it down here, but the source of it couldn't a lot of that, since we do have the Arctic haze that's as big as the continent of Africa hanging over the, our continent here. Uh, couldn't the source of it actually be from China? Yes. Yeah, that, that, ha that haze was probably initially Russia and, and portions of uh, Eastern Europe, and it probably shifted with industrialization to China. But in the case of China, I think the atmospheric scientists are sh showing, and if any of them are here, they can help me with this, that it's pretty much direct. It's China over Russia into Alaska. That, that there is there is very little opportunity for dilution, which is not a solution to pollution. <laughs> and so we, we've gotten put onto a, basically a, a direct input. From, well, wouldn't from it be China. kind of disingenuous for us to try to, you know, s stop the sourcing here through, you know, stopping wood burning or whatever when it's actually in the Arctic haze and the inversion is what's keeping it, you know, in, in a high particulate level on certain days? I'm not sure about mercury here because it's wood burning usually and that's not a really good mercury source. I mean just particulates, 2.5, because oh, that's, yeah. that's part of the Arctic haze is particulates. Yes, yeah, and, and some of the, some mercury is being carried on those particulates, but it can also just be in the gaseous form that it's traveling. There were some questions over here I noticed. I, uh, I eat burbot probably at least four times a week in the winter. And I eat the livers. So would there be a possibilities of more mercury or whatever concentrating in the livers maybe in than the flesh? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you've you've yeah, I was waiting for a question like that. Yeah, burbot uh, are really interesting because in the winter they're the opposite of other fish. They, their livers grow and burbot are feeding like mad and that's when they have the highest lipid content and that's when their PCB concentrations are the highest. And when I was working in Barrow, we had to address this for communities that lived along rivers like the Colville River. Um, no one will give you advice because <laughs> liver is not a fish fillet. And so you're going to have to explore that on your own or get a hold of me and I can help you. But most, most well, I don't know of any organization that gives uh, consumption advice based on liver. We did, we did in Barrow, up in Barrow, they were very concerned about their subsistence food, so I had no problem finding funding to get that kind of work done. And I, I can get you the appropriate document to look at, and we had the state epidemiologist comment on it. So I, you know, you can email me, um, you can find it on the UAF uh, directory, 
and I'll share that with you. But you've brought up a very important issue that everything I presented here uh, that was regulatory based is based on fish fillet. And people eat some of the organs and, and other tissues too. And that's completely been uh, ignored as far as I can tell, except for folks like us that are hired by certain groups to specifically address, um, like pike as mentioned here, or burbot livers like I was asked to do when I worked for the North Slope Borough. It's a good, good point. Sorry I can't provide you any direct advice because it's all biased towards fish, muscle, and fillets. We have a question here. <clears throat> One of your early slides showed that the baseline for mercury had grown but then it had actually tapered there at the very tail yes, end near did. the current. I was wondering if there's any um, causes of that, uh, or, uh, um, if you uh, had deciphered that at all. Um, well, you can't see it now. Um, when, when certain, uh, when the air, Clean Air Act was enacted and, and other industrial practices changed, they had to put scrubbers and, so, and things like that on discharges. And so in the Wyoming area, it may have been due to policy changes in what was allowable to be emitted from the stacks and other sources. And it's also possible people switch to natural gas. I hate to be in Alaska and talk about energy all the time, but that, that, you're right, it showed a, a tendency to head down. Um, but in the Arctic, in some biota measures people are making, the trend is showing mercury's increasing. But that's a very good point that uh, Policy changes have shown effects for things like lead. We've seen dramatic decreases in, in concentrations of lead in the environment and people because we took lead out of the gas. And with changes like you're talking about, we reduce acid precipitation in New England and Canada by cleaning up what was coming out of the stacks in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. I had a question about uh you had uh, spoken earlier in the presentation about uh, farm salmon versus uh, wild-caught salmon yes. and their contaminant load because they were fed um, artificial uh, diets. And I wondered um, how do, uh, let's say, catfish that are farm-raised uh, compared to Atlantic salmon, are they similar in their contaminant load? Did you say catfish? Yeah, catfish that you, yeah, you can find in uh, Safeway or any place uh, like that. Catfish were on those unfortunate graphs that didn't come across on the MAC. Um, catfish tended to be very low in mercury and in PCBs uh, moderately. And I think because catfish are be being fed the grain more than fish meal. The salmon diets for far-raised salmon are very high in fish meal. And it's obviously to promote growth. They want that protein. And uh, that turned out to be one of the components that was leading to the higher contamination of farm-raised salmon than wild salmon. And so with the catfish, I think they're not getting as much fish meal. They're getting a higher grain diet. And I, I, went, I taught at Mississippi State for a while and had to study catfish, so luckily I knew that for you. But I think they have less fish meal in their diet. And it's a different fish, and so there may be differences in accumulation potential too. I think we'll take one last question over here, if that's okay. Or I can stay later too if people need to go. I'm fine. Okay. Especially when the boss is right in the front row. You know what can I do? <laughs> yeah. Uh, my first thought was, uh, do you support the pebble mine? Do you think that's going to contaminate the fish? Uh, that I think to me that's a. Uh, I'm Thanks. against the pebble mine because I watch movies and and uh, so I'm, I signed up that petition over there for wild salmon. Salmon. And my and my second part of the question has to do with the hit the hatchery that's in Fairbanks that hasn't opened and it's really uh, quite an ugly building <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so and, I, and the third part of the question has to do with the Chena River and how there's a lot of river grass and it's turning into a marsh so could you kind of address those three things pebble pebble mine and then the Chena marsh and then the hatchery and then just sure. however you want to say is that all contaminated right pebble mine is a good question uh, it comes up a lot and a lot of similarities with the Red Dog Mine uh, come to mind for me. And I, I don't know if Al Ott or someone who works with Al Ott's here, Al had to do a lot of work on Red Dog Mine where Red Dog Mine was put in a very mineral rich area and Red Dog Mine would have been tasked with cleaning up the existing stream. 
In other words, the geological sources there were putting minerals into the water that were, in some cases, above regulatory levels. So when the water was coming into Red Dog Mine, if it came out the same as when it went in, they would be discharging illegally. That's the dilemma you run into in these mineral-rich areas, that the streams and, and the other, the soils and some of the biota have relatively high concentrations of some of these elements because you put mines in areas that are mineral rich. I'm not copying out, that's the geology and the biology. And we did some studies when I was up in Barrow with caribou, and the same thing we found, that the caribou were feeding on mineral rich vegetation, and there was lead in there, but guess what? There was a lot of copper. But when they fed east of Barrow, they had low copper diets. So again, it's the dilemma, it's the Arctic dilemma. You go get your rich copper sources, in those watersheds that have a lot of copper, it comes with lead. I think we're gonna face the same thing with Pebble Mine, that some of the streams and some of the bodies of water they'll be dealing with already have high concentrations of some of these elements. And so are we gonna make them responsible for keeping it at that level or lowering it? I, I'm not in the regulatory business, but that seems uh, a little bit unrealistic. Now, as far as a catastrophe, risk assessment and a, a levy or a dam breaking, I can't comment on that. But if that load of metals was to enter the streams, <laughs> yeah, it'd be catastrophic. There's no question. But I can't tell you what the risk assessment models are saying about what would be the likelihood of that. But we have to keep in mind these, these mines go in areas that are mineral rich and that there are background levels that may be higher in those areas than in other areas that aren't mineral rich. Chena River. Uh, I'm going to guess nutrient inputs, increase uh, water temperature, and I am way out of bounds talking about botany. <laughs> but I would guess that some of those things are being looked at, that we might have nu increased nutrient input uh, from urbanization and other sources, and then the water temperature may be warmer, and that may be increasing vegetation. The hatchery, I know they're having trouble with, yes, elements. <laughs> comes down to toxicology. They're, they're having trouble filtering out some elements that would be very toxic to the fish. It wouldn't allow them to raise the fish in the hatchery. And I know it's very frustrating, and they're getting a new filtration system in, and uh, that should take care of it. And uh, we, we hope to have fish in there. As far as the architecture is concerned, I don't know. I haven't seen it finished yet, but uh, I, th I think they're struggling a lot with their water quality. And that goes to show how vulnerable these fish are to water quality. Cold water fish, like the sal salmonids, are very vulnerable to uh, changes in water quality. They're not very tolerant. And that's why they're struggling at the hatchery. And they're not the only hatchery to struggle with that. 